one of the key topics we want to speak about is network-wide assessment of bridge barrier safety. So basically with the bridge the barriers, I just want to talk about the need for actually undertaking assessment and the process that we do to assess bridge barrier safety and how you can do this in asset assist. Yeah, so I've put together a collection of photos here just showing some barriers that are on a network. So here we have an old timber barrier and what I want you to do as you see the photos is to think about the types of risk that you might perceive as a, a road user. So here we have something that was designed for pedestrians and it's, it's not great for uh, protecting against vehicle impact because it has a low strength. You've got deep, fast flowing water and you've got very little offset. Uh, from from the roadway to the edge of the bridge. Uh, in this photo here, we we have a, a concrete rail and um, post sort of barrier. And in this one, I guess the issues you're seeing there is the need to protect people from from a smaller, lower height uh, gully, but also have a design that's strong enough um, to prevent uh, vehicles at the speed they're driving at from uh, penetrating through the barrier. And in this one is probably a case for looking at appropriate detailing of the transition of the approach barriers um, on onto a structure. This is another one that's quite common on the network. Um, this one caught my attention because I'd done some load assessment, I believe when I was working at Vic Roads uh, for the capacity of this barrier. And then later on uh, saw a news article um, where a car had gone off the edge, uh, landed in the water below. In this case, again, one of the risk factors there is the, the land use underneath. Uh, being a river, um, you wouldn't want too much water in that uh, creek below before um, you'd be quite uncomfortable as the car driver, let alone dropping off and landing on your roof. Um, so these sorts of uh, barriers there, looking at the, the view of the roadway, there's a reasonable amount of offset from the running lane to, to the edge of the deck. Um, so giving the road user some time to regain control of their vehicle. In this case, we've got a more modern barrier. So this is Western Ring Road. Back in 2012, there was an incident uh, with a, a truck carrying sheep that ended up raining sheep on the uh, Princess Freeway below. And it just shows you that no matter what sort of barriers you have, there's uh, risks involved with uh, old barriers and new barriers. And the uh, current bridge design code uh, was just upgraded um, only about a month ago and that's included uh, provisions to further increase the strength and height of bridge barriers to cater for vehicles like this truck here. Um, obviously it's not desirable to have a, a rollover um, of a semi-trailer and that could cause um, significant injury to people below and disruption to traffic. This is another one, uh, not too much uh, later than the other one in 2013 on the Balti Bridge. Uh, a truck uh, partially went over the barrier there and unfortunately for the driver, uh, they fell quite, quite a few metres out of their cabin down onto the um, ground below. So again, I think this all highlights the need to understand the barriers you have on your network and how safe they are because we can make a real difference to people's lives. Um, in this way, not only does a bridge need to be strong enough so that we don't fall through it, but it also needs to have the appropriate safety features so when we drive over it, um, we can get from one side to the other um, without our in unnecessary injury. So I'll go through, um, oh, this was just one last um, slide here on, on situations, just showing a brand new barrier um, for a council, but um, there's totally inadequate um, posts and anchorage of those posts to be effective. So it's more of a delineator than a, a barrier. And so even we get new things today built um, to substandard arrangements and we need to be aware of that um, so that we can do something about it um, in the future. So I'd like to go through a process that the Bridge Design Code uh, had come up with so that we can actually assess the safety and appropriateness of barriers and what we've done with asset assist is we've adopted this method and uh, put it in a way that's easy uh, for asset owners to use 
and so that they can start to help save um, hopefully people's lives. So the steps are uh, in the code, AS5100, the Bridge Design Code, is a risk-based assessment. And what it requires uh, an assessor to do is obtain the um, AADT um, for a road. So that's the annual average daily traffic volume for the road. Uh, it then provides with factors where you adjust that annual average daily traffic to account for the site-specific uh, issues uh, you find there about the gradient of the road, etc. And I'll go through those in a minute. After you've done that, you need an understanding of the barrier performance you currently have. And then once you have that um, understanding, you can then look at the the performance level that you have compared to what you would desire to have under the code's um, risk-based assessment method. And that enables you to understand a deficiency. And by knowing that deficiency, you can then prioritise any works that you wish to do to address the highest deficiency, uh, presumably first through to the least. So the factors that we use to determine the adjusted AADT um, are these R, T, G, D, C, U, U, S factors. Um, the code just abbreviates them, but in the essence it means the type of road. Is it one-way or two-way traffic? Um, is the road gradient steep? If it's steep as you come on the approach to a bridge, the bridge coming downwards, there's more likely to be an incident requiring a better barrier. If the curvature is really sharp, the code will tell you that it's more likely that you are to go off that bridge. If the land use below is deep water and um, maybe it's even a childcare centre or things like that, well then it's much more important um, to protect against an accident in those cases and it will adjust the AADT figure up higher um, is the principles of the code. So that's why I wanted you to focus previously on some of those photos I showed to just appreciate um, there is all sorts of different things happening both in new and old bridges. Um, probably the, the key feature with the old bridges is the, the lack of capacity of barriers, which I'll talk about now. So with the capacity of barriers, the, the bridge design code refers to them as essentially having no barrier on a bridge. Um, I'd also class that as being less than their low performance level, which is the first sort of capacity that you have. And a low performance level barrier is like a, like similar to a guard fence in, in a way, but um, uh, with plenty of posts to make it quite rigid. And then the code works through regular to medium to special performance. And this is ever increasing uh, strength and height requirements to meet these um, higher performance uh, levels. And the intent of the, the higher levels is to protect uh, against higher centre of gravity vehicles like that um, truck which uh, was carrying livestock um, and like the one on the Volte Bridge where the truck's gone over the top. A higher barrier, uh, a proper medium level barrier there would most likely protect that type of incident from, from occurring and would have saved that driver's um, a, a lot of injuries. Um, so the next thing, once you've got the adjusted AADT figure, the code um, presents a range of charts. In this case, if we look carefully, the, the chart talks about a threshold limit of 80 kilometres per hour um, at the bottom there of the figure. So the code presents charts for 80 kilometres per hour, 110 kilometres per hour, different speeds. And so when you're assessing a site, speed is a factor that leads to risk as well. And we, I think most road users are pretty well aware of that. We've reduced speeds around school zones and built up areas. Uh, likewise, with a bridge, we find the same thing. The higher the speed, um, then the more inclined we are to want uh, uh, a certain performance level barrier sooner. So on the left-hand axis, we have the adjusted AADT, which we spoke about how we work that out. And we can use that, and we can use on the x-axis the percent heavy vehicle count from our traffic surveys we do with our roads, and we can plot where we sit on a graph like this. The other thing with this graph, it's got a number of rail offsets. There you'll see that there's lines for 0.3 metre offset, 1.2 metre offset, 2.4 and 3.7. You might recall the bridge where I said, well, you could run very close to the, to the barrier versus the bridge where there's a footpath and you've got a lot of offset. 
Um, the greater the offset means, um, it's inherently that bit safer and you're less likely to hit the barrier in the first place. So just moving through now, if we just uh, have a go at using this graph for say a 0.3 meter offset, I've just highlighted the relevant lines there and all the other lines, if I have a 0.3 meter offset become irrelevant. And if we just move on from that, um, we'll see, thanks Adam. We'll see that we end up with um, three sort of distinct areas on these graphs. The, the area of the graph where we could have a low performance level, the area where we'd need regular, and an area where we'd need medium level, depending on where we sit with our adjusted AAD, T and commercial vehicles. So if we just plot a point for a second here, um, if we had a low performance level barrier and we found our adjusted AADT was where the X is marked and the percent heavy vehicles, that would mean that we actually have a deficiency for a low level barrier because we're plotting above the, the zone where a low level is appropriate. So we can just show that on the graph. Um, and that deficiency, sorry, is the, the distance between where the, the X is marked and where the low level line is. So what I'd like to do now that I've just spoken about the general principles of the code, I'd like to apply it to a particular situation. And um, by doing that, I then uh, like to demonstrate it in asset assist. And this is where I might get um, Hamish later on to type some values in to show how it actually works in asset assist and how we can do something that is pretty fiddly uh, to do um, outside of the software, how it can be made quite easy and therefore the, the the reason why we introduced it in the first place and also the intent to make a difference um, to, to people who are using these assets and hopefully save some lives or save some injuries. So what we have here is I've taken a street view from uh, Google and um, in that we see an instance where we've got a bridge and it's got a footpath on one side and um, on the other side there is none. So one barrier is uh, seemingly a higher risk than the other or one edge of the bridge is seemingly higher risk. If I go close to the edge, I'm more likely to go off. Um, the other thing we see is it's really uh, quite a low level barrier. It's got a chain mesh fencing. You might use it for the front fence of your house. And then it's got a steel tubing, which is barely embedded into concrete posts. So um, at best, that would be a low performance sort of level barrier. The gradient is relatively flat. The road comes up. It's Point Cook, it's a road just outside of um, Melbourne and um, it's, it comes up over this freeway but relative to flat. So we'll move on to the next um, so slide. And so what I was able to do is you can go on to VicRo's website and you can retrieve the AADT figure, the percent heavy vehicles. Um, you can look up and down the road for the, um, the sort of the posted limit to get a feel for the design speed. Um, from the imagery, you can get the um, curvature by just looking at a satellite view. Um, we can assess the performance level, having a, a look at it in terms of where it sits on a, a, a rating. And in that one, as I said, would be lucky to be low, um, most likely less than low. The barrier offset you can roughly measure from a satellite image um, and knowing the width of footpaths and things typically of the day. Um, and in this case, we've got a lane arrangement of the two-way undivided road. So all this information I've been able to glean from sitting at my desk in the office. Um, so I just wanted to highlight how simple this is actually to do and so that there is no excuse not to be doing this and ensuring the safety of road users or understanding the risks that they're taking and then working towards mitigating those. Here's another view just from Princess Highway, a freeway from Street View. You can kind of get a feel for the height the road is above the, the um, the bridge is above the road underneath. Um, we've got the impression it is a high high use road underneath being a, a freeway. Um, so there are all sorts of things that you pick up. So the deck height is about six metres, great against flat. There's no water depth applicable, but it is high occupancy land use in terms of uh, many vehicles per day. So if we just go through, so in, in asset assist, um, I mean, we might be able to point to the risk tab, and then I think we could even move through to an example um, in asset assist. So the current performance level was uh, less than low. Yep. 
what we said. The AADT figure is um, 12,000, 12, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 21,000, Amish. 21,000. Uh, yep. What else would you like? Uh, right, so it was a two way divided road, is that right? Yes, correct. Yep. Uh, so the, the depending on what you choose here in the drop down, it'll um, automatically put a, a value in there for your RT adjustment. Do yep. we have a downgrade percentage? Uh, zero percent. It was uh, essentially flat. Yeah. So if you put in your, your downgrade percentage, it will automatically calculate your GD for you. Um, I should mention too that um, you know, if it does calculate some of these fields for you, but you can override it. So if you if you wanted to you put in one point two, for instance, um, radius I think is not a, a mandatory field. That again, that's used to automatically calculate your your CU. So um, do you have? Is there a radius there, or is there a I CU? If you put say ten thousand meter uh, meter radius, um, it'll be sufficiently straight. Yep. So CU is one. So another way of doing it, if we had it left um, the radius is blank, we could have put in a CU of one, but it achieves the yep. same thing. Yep. Tech height, yep. I think we have about six metres. Right, so put in six metres. And then uh, the land occupancy. High occupancy land use. Yeah, because that was that's because it's close to Melbourne. Is that right? Uh, more about the uh, Hamish, the usage underneath. So it had a freeway which had a high volume of traffic. Um, so that would be classed as yeah. if, you, if a vehicle went off that structure, uh, then uh, it's likely to cause problems uh, below for the people below. Not only for the person in the vehicle, but um, there's collateral damage. Yeah. Yeah, so you got, you got your water depth. So in, in this case, it's not relevant because there, there is no water underneath. But if if the bridge was above um, uh, uh, water, then if the water level is greater than, say, a metre, um, you know, if you come off the bridge into the water, then that's going to be you know, a bad situation. So I think in this yeah. case, it's zero. Yes, correct. And then the speed we had was um, 60 kilometres per hour. So it's the speed yeah. on, on the bridge. So just like you were saying before, you got the the um, options that are that are in the standard. Yeah. So uh, the idea there is if if um, uh, it would be to be slightly conservative if you needed it to be if the speed was really fifty, you would still choose the sixty uh, yeah. figure. Yeah. Uh, and then the rail offset. What was that? Uh, we had two different ones. So we'll try at one point two meters to start off with. Yep. And the truck volume was 5%. Yep. Uh, okay. So then it's, yep. So you got your, your adjusted AADT now. Yeah, and what it's suggesting there, Hamish, is that we should have a um, regular performance level and it's estimated a deficiency in this yep. case. And it has expressed the deficiency as the AADT amount um, that we're in excess of what we can cope with, which goes back to an earlier graph I showed uh, when we had the red lines up and plotting NX above, say, a low level, um, were that many vehicles above where we can comfortably operate. We need to either reduce the vehicle count, the AADTs, dramatically, or we need to improve the uh, bridge barrier performance level. And you need to keep in mind the chart-based method the code presents came from American studies, which looked at the cost benefit to the community of certain barrier performance levels. And so it's been working out what, um, what the code thinks is reasonably, in a way, reasonably practicable to provide um, in terms of the cost benefit uh, for road users. So we need to keep that in mind uh, is how this, this whole um, method has come about in the Australian Bridge Design Code. And so as we allow greater volumes of traffic, we're exposing uh, people to greater real or there's more likelihood of something actually going wrong at this site. Um, likewise, if we have uh, more heavy vehicles, um, there's more likely something to go wrong of a significant nature. Um, if we, we squeeze more lanes on a, on a bridge and have less barrier offset, there is more likely to be an incident. So if we're changing those parameters, 
as a asset owner, we need to be careful that we're not overlooking the safety of the road user um, in the process of doing it. So what we could do here, Hamish, you can actually add in the barrier for the other side of this bridge as well. Do you want to just show how that's done? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we just add a new entry. Uh, so a lot of the, everything's going to be the same, basically, uh, apart from that rail offset. Yeah. Uh, so we go 0% zero, zero and downgrade. I'll uh, change that to 1.2 because that's what I had before. Uh, deck height is 6. We have a high land occupancy. Um, so it's also worth mentioning too that um, in Asset Assist, your structure, if it has a line associated with it, um, you can set the speed on the line and then that will automatically come through. So it can save you a little bit of typing if you've got that set up. So you're correct. For those who have the, the roads module, uh, it will read the AADT figure out of the uh, capital editor where it's saved. It'll read the speed value off the segment of the road that we're dealing with. It'll look up where the bridge is and which segment it's on and report those figures back and automatically fill them for you. So if you change the speed uh, on your road network, it will then uh, understand that and pull the data through. And that's the benefit of having um, a system that can manage all sorts of assets in the one spot and then use the data uh, in a clever way. Yep, uh, so what was the, the other rail offset that you had? Uh, 2.4 metres. 2.4, you're at 5% and yeah, so there your, your chart-based performance level is low rather rather than regular. Yeah, we're still getting a, yeah. yeah. We still get a um, a significant deficiency because we said the barrier was less than low in the first place. And so once you're less than low, you're not meeting any particular um, car requirements. So every vehicle that travels and adjust the full adjusted AADT is an issue. Hamish, if we go back and change the barrier performance level just to test the sensitivity, if we said, oh, you know, it's not less than low, let's call it low, because we're, we're unsure and we just want to see what happens, and you could change that for both of them. Yep. What, what we'd find is we'd have a deficiency um, uh, on one side of the road, um, but not on the other side of the road. Um, so what we're saying is the offset where the footpath is, if we have a low performance level barrier, could actually cope, cope with that uh, from a chart-based risk assessment method. Um, but however, the other side of the road should actually have a, a better performance level barrier. And in here it's saying we desire regular level. One last thing I'll say before we move on to um, talk about some of the new developments, because we, we've got about another 15 minutes left. Um, is there's a site-specific, site-based performance level, and you can actually choose to say that given the circumstances of this particular site, I want something more stringent or less stringent than the chart-based method. Now, not many asset owners, I haven't spoken to one who wants something less stringent than the chart-based method, um, but uh, there is um, the requirement in some instances where I might have a, a bus route or things like that, and the chart-based method doesn't pick up quite um, that well on the value of having better performance levels um, barriers. So you can actually um, address that through selecting a site-based um, level. And lastly, what we do is there's a, re a report you can run um, to summarize it across your whole network, uh, your barrier um, of a compliance or deficiency and therefore you can prioritise across your whole network um, where to spend, spend your money. So, Hamish, yeah. that's probably enough for today, sort of introductory um, overview of um, barrier risk assessment, um, just highlighting the need to, to actually understand the risk uh, to road users as the network does change and how we've streamlined the whole chart-based method. So you don't need to understand that chart or multiple charts are in the code you can uh, simply type in the required input and um, start to get an answer. It's still something that some organisations would want 
to engage a, a bridge engineer in to um, understand it, but it can be done quite quickly. As I showed, even without going to a particular site and looking at a particular asset owner's asset with the publicly available information, as I did. I think where we're heading with the software too, another uh, major enhancement we'll do before the end of the year is on um, heavy vehicle route assessment. And so we're looking to put in a load assessment uh, module uh, that will enable um, asset owners to get information from the heavy vehicle regulator when they send a permitting request and to process that in a streamlined manner. Um, again, just looking at ensuring the safety of uh, road users. I think we'll um, call an end to the webinar and just thank you again for the, the time um, that you've made at this time of the year, being a very busy time to, to come in on the uh, presentation. If there's anyone else in your organisation you wish to share the information with, we'll uh, put out a recording to uh, YouTube and um, the other thing is a number of the past sessions have been uh, put on YouTube as well. So if you search for Asset Assist, you should be able to uh, load those up and uh, share that information with, with other people who might find it interesting. So thanks again for your time.